years ago, police were called to this house in a suburb of Houston on what they thought was a routine homicide. What they found was the bullet-ridden body of Dean Carl and a crying 17-year-old named Elmer Wayne Henley. Carl had been Henley's friend and mentor, and by killing him, Henley put an end to a two-year torture and serial killing spree. What's good, guys? Welcome back to the Milk Carton Series. I'm your host, Stephanie. If you are new, and as always, guys, we thank you for tuning in. Hello, everybody, except this damn bump on my forehead. <laughs> And to throw that in there because it's irritating my soul y'all well welcome back to day two hope that my little moments crack you up i'm really a goofball in real life y'all i don't like to always be so serious i love to laugh but nonetheless welcome back to day two <laughs> i know you're probably liking me saying two because some of y'all don't say it the way i say it but um yeah welcome back so today guys you ever heard of the Candyman, right? Well, we all know the Candyman. Yeah, I ain't gonna say that name no dang on more because you already know how that is. If you say it five times, he's gonna come get you and he ain't gonna come get me. No, he not. So, <laughs> we're gonna call this man by his name, Dean Coral. Now, Dean Coral lived in Houston, Texas, and he was known for being the C-Man because we're not gonna keep saying that name. Um... <laughs> But it turned out on a serious note that he was a serial killer, y'all. Like, he complied and killed and raped 28 young boys and men. And he also had help with it from some teenagers, y'all. Like, sick. It's all ranged from the 1970s to like 1973 in Texas. And when I started to read this case, I really got disturbed because I'm like, you are mother effing sick. Like, sick. Ugh. Now, to many people, Dean Coral was a very nice man. He, no one would ever suspect it, let's say that, that he would be the one out here doing this heinous crime. And he got the name C-Man because, y'all think I'm, I'm joking, I'm dead serious, I'm not saying the name again. He got that name because he would hand out candy because his family had an actual candy company. And so he would basically hand out a lot of candy to the children in the neighborhood. Now, as I was looking back at his upbringing, not that... I hate to be the one to say like your upbringing does it it shapes who you are but oftentimes it married it very much does because a lot of people grow up in environments where it's very strict or very disciplinary and that's kind of what dean grew up in he grew up in an environment where his father was very strict very disciplinary when things would go wrong and it had been stated that his mother and father had a good marriage but they would argue a lot a lot and you know his family basically believed in you get good grades you be a good gentleman basically putting a lot of good quality good qualities into him but oftentimes when you're doing overly too much, your children grow up to rebel. And I kind of think that's what happened to him. Not that it excuses any of his heinous crimes or behaviors, but his mother and father ended up getting a divorce and his mother and father ended up getting married twice. But after she left him, his mother decided that it was time to travel a little bit, venture out, and she ended up meeting a salesman in Vendor, Texas, and that's where they ended up moving. So in the mid 1950s, Dean's mother and stepfather ended up creating a candy business by the name of Pecan Prince. As the business began to build, Dean and his brother would basically kind of be the ones handling the machine. They started at a very young age, actually, as I was reading, and his mother, would help doing different things in the business and his stepfather would actually be out trying to sell the candy you know pitching it whatever it is i can only imagine how the distribution of candy was was back in 1950. time goes on you know dean becomes an adult well yeah semi-adult he ends up being enlisted into the army but he ends up getting out because he explained that he needed to help his mother, you know, with her company. The company is then revamped as it goes on and he begins to be the vice president of this company, this candy company, right? And 
As I was reading, it begins to say how there was very much signs of Dean being interested in young boys. And oftentimes, mothers are people, period. They are the person's biggest down pit of allowing them to do certain acts. So as I stated, there were signs that were noticeable about Dean. Well, there was a young boy who worked for the candy company and he had complained that Dean had made some sexual advances to him. So instead of Dean's mother basically, you know, saying something to him like that's not, you know, that's not right, whatever, putting him in this place, she fires the young boy. And I get it, you don't want to ruin your reputation for your company, but you already ruin it because you fire someone because of the sexual advances that your grown son is doing. Oh, so as this story unfolds, right, y'all, it was like this candy company was the magnet for bringing in young boys. So a lot of people were fascinated about the candy company and it was a very welcoming environment for young boys teens to come through and Dean he decided that he wanted to build a pool table kind of like a friendly family friendly you know environment where you know you go to just relax chill whatever and that's where it adapt it brought in more young boys but a lot of people would begin to complain about Dean and how he would be very flirtatious to them and it had been stated that Dean would basically meet these people because of the candy so like i'm giving you candy making friends with you and that's how he would build you know that relationship so there was one 12 year old boy there was one 12 year old boy by the name of david brooks who he met by giving him candy right and he ended up grooming this young boy and he ended up basically having sex with this boy and then bribing him with the gifts them with, he would bribe him with a gift so that way he wouldn't tell anyone that what was going on. Can you imagine 12 years old? September 1970, Dean's mother had already moved on from Houston, Texas. She was currently living in Colorado. And this is when Dean killed his very first victim. So his first victim was by the name of Jeffrey Conan. He was an 18 year old who was hitchhiking from Austin to Houston. And if you guys don't know how far that is, baby, that's far. Because when I was trying to look at how far to drive from Houston to Austin to see, I was like, uh, yeah, nah, not going. A few months later in December, he had basically killed two more young boys. And Brooks, the young boy that I spoke about earlier, he basically walked in on Dean sexually assaulting these two young boys. And he lies to Brooks and tells him that he sent these kids away, but really he ended up killing them. Like, can you imagine? Can you imagine like someone lying to you and saying that they were doing like a gay pornographic ring and then you end up, you lie and say like you sent them away whole time you killed him. The thing about it is he continued to bribe Brooks. So he ended up buying Brooks a Corvette and giving him money in order to silence him. Like, chow, what? So one of the boys Brooks brings to Dean was by the name of Emmer Henley. But he decides that he doesn't want to kill Emmer, right? And instead, he grooms Elmer, just like he did Brooks, basically telling him this scheme of a porn ring, whatever you have it, basically lying out of his tail and ends up grooming him as well. It had been stated that Dean would basically tell these two boys that I'll give you money if you bring me young boys. And they ended up doing it in order to make money. I mean, could you imagine not having no money and you meet someone who has money and they're trying to bribe you into this this thing? I, I, uh, I thought it was sick, but at the same time, I didn't want to displease him. I wanted to please him. I, was, I wanted to, you know, to be proud of me. And so these two basically would help him get young boys. They would drive in his vehicle offering whatever, candy, alcohol, you name it, in order to get young boys into their vehicle to take him to take them to Dean. 
And Elmer basically says he did it because his family's hard financial hardships led him to this. They would bring two young boys, they would bring the boys to Dean and they would tie them up, gag them, and they would basically tie them up to a wooden torture board that they had. And all three of them would take turns in raping these victims. Like, at what point does your financial hardships, n like, no longer matter? Like, what you are doing is very wrong because all of the boys that you are bringing to Dean potentially die they're either strangled shot whatever you know what i'm saying so at what point does that come into your mind like is it really worth me doing this for some money like i get it but at the same time when does morals and you know integrity come into play what makes it even sadder is that they would make these young boys write postcards to their families letting their families know that they were okay when in fact they were not okay so one of dean's victims was a 17 year old by the name of mark scott now his parents did not come to play they did what was right so when mark disappeared they reported him missing so then shortly after they ended up receiving that postcard that he said he moved, he moved, he found a job making $3 an hour, whatever. His family was not buying it because they said he would just not abruptly pick up and leave us without letting us know. That's just not the relationship that we have with our son. And I'm like, yes, as I'm reading this, I'm like, yes, because you know your kid. You like, I'm not saying kids don't do do these things but you know as a mother you know in your heart and the boy's father he basically said that he would camp out at the police station every day every night trying to figure out where his son was at if they were actually actively looking for him and the police basically told him that your son's a runaway why are you looking for him and i'm just like so even if he was a runaway you're not supposed to look for your kid like he doesn't matter so back in Texas in 1970, of course it's Texas, right? It wasn't illegal for your child to be, to run away yet. And I guess like the police chief, he was ended up voted out as these, as Dean Coro's cases began to hit the mainstream. August 8th, 1973, this is when these mass murders would basically come to an halt. So Dean and Henley basically were going at it. Henley had brought a girl, the first girl ever, to Dean's house and another guy to the house. And, you know, Dean basically wakes up and he sees that he's tying up these two victims. And he's like, why would you bring a girl to my house? Basically going off. And Henley, you, you know, they're going at it. They're fussing, you know. And he basically is like... I'm tired of you killing my friends. I don't know from what was said in the article, I guess the girl who survived, she basically tells the story as though like he, something must have awakened in Henley. Like he was fed up of luring victims to Dean's house. And so they were going at it. And Dean basically was telling Henley like, you're not gonna do anything to me. And lo and behold, Henley shoots this mofo six times and he dies. So after killing Dean, they ended up calling law enforcement and confessing everything that they have done. Now, now Brooks has denied any involvement as far as the killings. He says that he did not and was not involved in the killings, but they did end up showing law enforcement where the bodies were, where they had, you know, buried them or whatever. Law enforcement was able to cover 28 bodies. The last body was found in 1983, but the other, other 27 were found in like a makeshift grave and then some in like a boat shed. So Henley ends up getting like six life terms and Elmer ends up getting like one life term. But nonetheless, they're in prison for a long time, time, time. They're gonna die in there. And you know, law enforcement basically say they don't even know if 
28 is the actual number because who knows how many more people you know dean may have killed prior to grooming these two young boys and that's the scary part like he groomed these two boys to help him kill many of his victims like sir what they didn't call it was uh um, it was like going through the looking glass you know nothing was real nothing was right so i was living in a madman's world you were a madman no so Henley, he basically, if you guys ever seen Mindhunter, he was portrayed in that if you guys didn't watch it. I really hope that show comes back. I know the director wanted to take a break or the producer, whoever, wanted to take a break from it. Because it is a very heavy show when you think about all the murders, all the serial killers that are involved. But Henley, he, after being arrested, he lived a very loud life. Like they had a Facebook page created for him. He showed like some of his artwork. And he basically describes, you know, some of the murders and how his only regret is that Dean is not alive so he can show, so he can basically tell him off. Now, Brooks, he lived a much more quieter life behind prison and he ended up dying last year from COVID. Crazy story when you think about the Seaman, because we're not saying that name. But um, it's just crazy because it's like, you know, back then, with all those mass murders going on, people crazy. Now I want to rewatch Mindhunter because I'm sitting here trying to remember him in, you know, in the um, story. That is pretty much today's episode, guys. I hope you are enjoying Crime Tober so far, and I will see you tomorrow for day three. Bye, guys.